Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Hi, I'm Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. I'm here today to tell you I'm addicted. No, not to drugs or alcohol, but frankly, to public speaking. What? You heard me. I love it. I will go out of my way if there is an opportunity to present to a group. I actually even try to manufacture them sometimes just so I can get out there and speak. Now, I wasn't always that way. If you listen to the show, you've heard about my journey of being a little on the shy side and frightened to death about getting in front of people. And it really wasn't. Uh, until I was playing in a band. I was a drummer in the band at the time. And one of the singers was hearing me sing uh, in the background. They said, you got a good voice. Why don't you come up and sing? And that was like pulling teeth. It probably took a few months to actually get me out there. But eventually they did. I think my first song, which was probably Teddy Bear by Elvis Presley, I had my back uh, you know, to the practice stage. I was so concerned that I was going to mess up. But that incident changed my life. I went from being fearful to being fearless when it came to getting out there and doing any kind of public speaking. And eventually I had opportunities to speak 13, 14, 15, 16 times a year uh, around the country, especially during my days of the action sports industry, because I was the guy with the data and everybody wanted that data. So that was fantastic. So that was pre-COVID. Now, Post-COVID here or in COVID, we're not quite post-COVID yet. It gets to be a little more difficult. I have been speaking um, via Zoom to groups, and it, it's certainly a different different way to do it. But, man, did I, I just love it. Did I say I loved it? Man, I really love it. However, there's a lot of challenges out there to being a speaker, finding the right opportunities, creating a compelling presentation, frankly, that's relevant to your audience that people want to sit and listen to. There is nothing worse and giving a presentation, uh, especially on Zoom and seeing everybody's head down doing something else, right? That's Zoom etiquette, by the way. I hope you listen to that. Please pay attention. And ultimately, of course, the speakers, we all want to make some money. That's an ultimate reinforcement. But imagine there are people who do nothing but speak for a living and make a lot of money. So COVID or no COVID, It is one of my dreams, and I bet you it's one of yours as well. So today, if it is, you've come to the right place. My guests today are Richard Mulholland, founder, and Samantha Leonsinis, managing director of the company Missing Link. They are both here today to start you down the path of becoming an authority and bringing your experience to the stage. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this message. Your strategic plans are essential to managing your business's growth. Spend the time to develop a cohesive roadmap to follow to ensure your entire team is moving in the right direction. These plans should take the insights and the brand strategy work you've already completed to help you achieve your long-term business and growth objectives, as well as keep you competitive. These are actionable plans and should include the details of achieving your growth, including tactical implementations, timelines, budgets, and KPIs for success. Developing your plan is a team sport. Make sure you include the stakeholders from each of your strategic departments in your organization because everybody in the company is impacted by the success or failure of your plans. The following are six key questions to ask yourself. Do you have a clear understanding about what you're trying to achieve? Number two, what does your brand stand for in the eyes of your customers? Three, why do your customers buy from you? Four, what are your competitors doing? And five, What is your approach to sales? Where are your opportunities for revenue coming from? And number six, how can you differentiate yourself from your competition? Visit theponzigroup.com to learn more. As I mentioned, I'm joined by Richard Mulholland, the founder, and Samantha Leonsinis, managing director of the company Missing Link, to take us on a journey today that I'm really particularly excited about. Sam and Richard, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's there's three of us here today, and uh, so we'll try to communicate via hand signals, um, and I'll kind of maybe call you out as we're talking, um, and I'll let you guys also decide who's going to do the speaking. 
but I'm excited to have you here. And really, for to put it in context of, of about what Missing Link is and what what you guys do, why don't one of you take the lead and tell the audience a little bit about Missing Link? Missing Link is a presentation company that I started all of 23 years ago now when I was 22. And with the purpose of helping people be really less sucky when standing in front of other human beings. Uh, I think that human attention is wasted all the time with bad presentations. And I wanted to go to war with that idea and try and make sure that when we get in front of a group of people, that we respect their attention and activate them accordingly. Well, you just used a fantastic line. I don't remember seeing it on your website, so I can make you less sucky. I like that because uh, we, we've all been there. Uh, unfortunately, I think I've probably been one of those guys once before, maybe twice, maybe three times. But more often than not, of course, in the audience and, and you guys probably know way more than I do. There's nothing worse than sitting through a presentation that's just bloody agony that you're sitting there and trying to be attentive, trying to be nice to the speaker. But in the meantime, you're all you're thinking about is, you know, when can I go have lunch or whatever? Yeah, submarine mode. Uh, every every audience member in the world is a highly trained black belt in submarine mode. It's the idea that you look at the you look at the presenter. Your your head is still there. You're perfectly tuned at watching them. You even laugh when other people laugh, but you have no idea what you're doing. You were planning lunch or something else, and our job is to is to sink the submarines. Like we don't want that. We want to make people that are so attentive that they they don't realize that the presentation finished. And they're like, oh, wow, I actually paid attention to that. I mean, I can't tell you how often people come up to me and say, dude, I actually paid attention to your whole presentation. I said, well, thanks, but that was the that was the plan. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah that's great. Well, I, I mean, again, I think that's – so what you're doing, and again, having been on that side and, and worked with other people helping with their presentations, but, but even for myself, uh, and again, just creating the content that you think is going to be relevant – and then figuring out a way to present it. So we're going to get into that. But 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 the pandemic. So I have a, some questions I always like to ask. So certainly you're a presentation company and working with lots of people and giving presentations yourself. COVID hits. You have to pivot. So given all that's gone on with with your business, what keeps you up at night when you think about growing, continuing to grow your business? Okay, so so much. The biggest thing is not taking everything this opportunity is given to us. Because as soon as you, if you think about it, your presentation's job is to change human beings, right? To make people better because you spoke. Uh, if you're a business leader, you want to, you know, maybe give your audience, let them feel that they're safe, that they have vision, that they have somewhere where they want to go. When we had to pivot our medium of delivery, but we didn't have to pivot our purpose. Our purpose was to help leaders lead loud uh, and through stages. And what happened is that as soon as it all went online, it opened up the stages that we could impact from around South Africa to anywhere on the planet. And my, what keeps me awake at night is that we've not done a big enough job of leveraging the opportunity that we've been given. If you're an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are driven by fixing a problem or filling a gap. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. What this did is it created a meaningful problem and a really big gap that somebody has to fill, and I want it to be us. And what keeps both Sam and I up at night is thinking about how we make sure we don't miss that opportunity. Sam, do you want to add something there? Yeah, I think – so one of the, 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 the pivotal moments that I had in the last six months with our global – kind of the impact in South Africa is that I've worked with Rich on and off for most of my adult career for like 20 years. And he is um, the type of entrepreneur that's constantly looking for the next thing that we need to, we need to be involved in that makes sense to our business. And it's frustrating sometimes as the co-pilot to always be changing routes. But this time, like Rich would say, Sam, this, this, and this. And I check in with him three days, three to five days later and say, okay. So on that, that, he'd be like, no, 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 we're not doing that anymore. And I'm like, what? I was like, that's, that's what you said like three days ago. And he was like, that was three days ago. And <laughs> now it doesn't, it feels like that's necessary. Like we, you have to be watching and adapting all the time. It's not about standing still and, and waiting to, to see what the new normal looks like. 
Like that's not an option. Sam, I think one of your kids just killed another one of your kids. Yeah, I, I heard that in the background. This is this is not a Halloween show, everybody. <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> Working and, from and home. Have, hashtag twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, and I and I have to say uh, for the for the listeners. So I'm in Southern California. They're in South Africa, and I'm actually jealous because I'm over here drinking coffee, and I can I can see them even though you can't. And Sam is over there drinking a glass of wine. So I guess that's just the time of the day. Um, but I love it. I love it. And I have to say, too, um, I, I, I've watched some videos and your office is freaking cool. And I've seen a lot of offices with bowling alleys and all sorts of other stuff. But your entire environment is just outrageous. I mean, I, I love the the whole concept, the bird's nest and the tree house and, and the slides and the fireman's pole. I mean, it's it looks like a freaking blast. So um uh, I'm my hats off for all of that, man. That is, that is, that's a great environment. And certainly it's about the, the creativity and, and freedom to explore and think. And, and maybe those are my words, but that's what I get out of all of that. So fantastic. And, and you listeners, you got to go online. You got to check this out. I think I saw that uh, video on YouTube. So, so it's going to be, a- Angela, yeah. I'm going to say spoiler alert, but um, thank you so much for that. Cause that was a, a really awesome project that Rich and I worked on for a long time. And we basically turned around an empty shell in six weeks and turned that into what you saw on that episode. Um, But the spoiler alert is that thanks to a global pandemic, we are a 100% remote business. Oh, so we're going to empty (laughs) office. (laughs) <laughs> oh, it's an empty bird's nest. <laughs> so, so we, we've we've taken all all that energy and put it into our remote working, which has been incredible. Okay. Do you still have I the office? talk about no? Mm. Okay. Maybe two of the things. So the first thing was as much as it was about creative space, uh, it was actually more of to prove to our customers. So, in my mind, I realized that I was trying to sell presentations to people who would be paying us. What for one presentation, what they'd be paying their PA or their assistant a whole month's salary for. So I realized they don't have a presentation problem. They have a, oh, goodness, being on stage and being boring is something I don't want to be problem. So what we did is we wanted to set up an office that was an antidote to boring because they were worried that they were going to be, oh, I'm going to be so boring. The presentations are so boring. So when we built the office, it was less about us because it doesn't matter how creative your space is. After one week, it's just your desk. It's just work, right? And and so that was always, a, it was partially marketing, partially attracting the right type of individual to come and work in an organization. But one of the biggest limiting factors, it was two things that led to us closing it. So it was already our strategy to close it before COVID struck. Uh, it was two reasons for it. The one was that it geographically anchored us. So we thought that if, you know, for you to get a proper missing link experience, you had to be 45 minutes drive from the office because we wanted to give you that company experience. We bought a stretch limousine and we'd pick you up and we'd drive you there. But that meant I was stuck dealing with somebody in the greater Johannesburg area. And I also live a, a two hour flights away. So that that was a problem. That was the first thing. And then the second thing was that uh, it was just an old people spoke about our office more than they spoke about what we did. So we generated so much PR for the environment we worked in and people kept on calling us a creative organization, but we see ourselves as a consultancy. We see ourselves as a smart business, not just creativity for creativity's sake. So it got to the point in the end where we started saying, hey guys, we're not gonna do interviews anymore if you wanna talk about our office. That's not, that's not where the story's at. So bizarrely, what became our superpower early and got us a lot, and the office before was also pretty cool, got us a lot of press ended up holding us to an old way of thinking. And we knew we had to let go of that superpower, that thing that did us so well in order to move forward to the next phase of our business. That, you know, that's a great point. I mean, your, your office tended over, became your brand almost. And uh, so I commend you for that. I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, we all, uh, you know, in our home environments for me personally, and, and throughout a lot of my career, I actually, in this office, this is where I've worked. I've always worked remotely. As a matter of fact, when I was growing my agency originally at a marketing agency, I used to have seven people come to my house and work in this room and in the next room with me because I, I always felt having offices before eventually became 
the, you know, the clients were going to come. Well, the clients never really came unless the, usually we, we had clients that would come on a Friday early because they wanted to go home early. Oh, right. As to you. Yeah. It, yeah. So, and so having that, I mean, I've had the high rises that, that nobody ever came to and just became a big expense. But, but our, our office in, in Irvine, which was in a high rise, it was designed by one of the high end architectural firms. I mean, the walls were slanted and it was this really interesting shapes. But it became, to your point, not quite like yours, a, a focal point that people used to like to talk about. But for us, it was, you know, that's where we sat and that's where we did our work. So um, but let's move off of that then, because I don't want this isn't about your office. I just didn't have to mention that. Very cool, oh, though. I loved you. it. We're very proud of it. Congrats. We are very. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you both the same question. And I'm going to go with you first, Sam. Cool. What is the best business advice you've ever received? Don't try and do everything. Hire people who know more than you do. Okay. I love that. Rich, you, same thing, same question. I'm not sure offhand. I may want to spin back to that. I'd like to give it some thoughts. I've had a lot of really, really great advice. Uh, and I've had a, a number of coaches that I've worked with throughout my career that have all helped me in different times, and it was pretty contextual. I would like to maybe mention one thing that was so important but it, the lesson was almost the, the timing was years ago, we lost one of our biggest clients. It was Nissan, the car brand. And my business coach who was with me at the time is an old German guy. And he got up out of my office. I was writing him a letter telling him how unfair it was. And he got out of, uh, got up in the middle of a session and said, I will be right back. And he left the office and he drove to a bookshop. He bought the book, Who Moved My Cheese? And he drove back in. He said, I will not let you send this letter until you've read this book. And he threw the book on my table. And then he went and he sat in reception. And... I always think that my lesson was that the book itself was great in the right time. But the one thing about advice, advice has to be given at the, exactly the perfect time. There, there's a hundred other times where if I'd been given that book, I would have hated it. But at that time, it was the perfect antidote for me getting in my own way in my business. And I, I realized then being a great coach is, is knowing the timing of when to deliver the right advice to people at the right time. And, and he just got it so dialed in. And I, again, I'd never recommended that book to anybody until about a month after COVID struck. And I thought, hey, this is the book you need to read again now. Your cheese has moved. Uh, that's interesting that you say that. Actually, um, I read the book years ago, and I think it was uh, late March, early April. Somebody gave me that book again because, again, trying to figure out marketing's being cut. What are we going to do? How can I continue to stay in front of people? And somebody said, hey, have you ever read this book? It's like, yeah, a long time ago. So uh, interesting that you bring that up. We talk about getting people on stage, getting them to do big presentations and things like that. And so I look at someone who might even be an expert in their field. And, and really moving them to become an authority. And I think that's part of the, the idea of standing and, and making presentations. So when you're working with somebody, and, I, and I'm, my next step, I want to get into that a little more detail, is how do you work with people to that move them, if they're an already an expert, to becoming an authority versus, you know, Tom, Dick, or Harry that decides they want to, you know, become a public speaker and they have no idea what they're doing and there's a lot more work there. I mean, you know, this becoming an authority is is really interesting to me. I actually had a guy out of London uh, just recently who his whole business is around taking experts and turning them into authority figures, if you will. So how do you work with somebody like that? OK, so the, you, you've touched on one half. So authority, I think there's two directions to come at authority. Uh, the one direction is expertise. So if you are an expert, uh, the other is research. And I think that both are perfectly viable. So what you have is you have some speakers who may be high expert, but low ability. So they're maybe the world's leading speaker in their field, uh, but they are terrible at speaking. With respect to J. Craig Fenter, the, map, the man who mapped the human genome, I've seen him speak twice, once at TED, once at PopTech. Absolutely incredible brain, horrific at delivering the message across. But if you do want to have somebody speak to you about mapping the human genome, that's who you're going to get because the authority is so high. But then on the flip side, you think about somebody like a Malcolm Gladwell. Now, Gladwell has high, high authority as a journalist, but actually the topics that he discusses 
are based on research, not based on experience. So his experience in the, the principles around the tipping point, for example, or outliers are low, but his ability to research is high. So I don't think not being an expert is necessarily precludes you from the stage, provided you're willing to do the work. And then, of course, you've got to work on the other side, which is ability uh, to make sure that, you, you know, you can get across a story. So if you, if you are low expertise, you can't get away with being low ability. If you're very, very high expertise, if you invented something or created something, then you can to a degree, to some degree. But then on the flip side is it comes down to structuring. So I don't think ability is necessary. It's not about how well you're able to uh, speak and present. It's about how well you're able to structure a narrative. Because I've seen a ton of speakers who they look like they're not the greatest in the world. And in fact, one example I often use, because my team can't stand them, is Elon Musk. Elon Musk looks like a terrible presenter, except at the end of the presentation, you want his stuff. So if you want his stuff, then he couldn't have been that bad. And he, he isn't a typical good presenter, but he understands the structure of which how to get an audience from where he picked them up to where he wanted to drop them off. And if he can do that effectively, you don't need to be this big, larger than life personality, as long as you understand the mechanisms required for, for driving human attention. And I think he understands that just fine. So I, I don't think it has to start from expertise. I think that it is great if you're an expert. I think a stage is a great way for you to become an authority figure. But I'm not sure that that's the only departure point. I'm an expert at something. It could be that I want to be seen as the world's expert in something that I'm not. And if nobody else has put up their hand to be the expert, that could be you. Simon Sinek is the world's leading expert in the world why. And nobody can tell me what he did for a living before he did that TED Talk. Like, he had no reason being there, but he decided he put his hand up, and he is. That, that's a great point. It's a great point. There's a, a gentleman, I won't use his name, but and I've had a lot of conversation with him. He, he makes his living speaking, and a lot of times I'll talk to him, and he'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm researching a new topic. Somebody asked me if I could talk on it. He has no experience. Matter of fact, he had no experience in the topic that, that made him, you know, I won't say famous, but propelled him into the world of public speaking and getting getting paid for it. And now that's all he does. He looks for topics. He re he spends his entire days researching ideas. And then if he finds something that's relevant, he'll go research it, create a presentation, then start marketing it. So but he's not an expert in it, to your point, but he but he's researched it. And, and so he has all the details that he needs to have. So that's, anyway, yeah, but that's where we'd have to be. Right. So he so many people hold themselves back from taking to the stage because they they feel that they're not an expert enough in a category. But turning up and speaking and doing the research is actually often enough for what most people need from it. Uh, I think, yeah, I yeah. think that's a, even experts would do well to start with research being the basis for your for your talk. Well, I, and, and I love that um, there was uh, for a long time. I'm looking at the skateboard guy behind you and. I was in the action sports industry for about 13 years and, and it all started. I, I worked, I did research as a consultant for a, a retail chain called Pacific Sunwear. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. And so clothing and stuff for, for teens and, and behind, and behind the glass, we doing focus groups was guys like Bob McKnight from Quicksilver and Bob Hurley. And they'd always say, we wish there was more research in this industry. Well, after about nine years, I went, you know, Maybe there's something to this. And I decided and created this company called Board Track, which was a surf, skate and snow, snowboard research company and then became more of a consultancy. I've never skated, surfed or snowboard in my entire life. But I all of a sudden had all the information, all the research to what we're talking about. And so I started giving presentations at all of the major shows, all the sporting goods shows. I was brought around the country because I was now the authority figure in in action sports and, and it's a it's a long journey trust me they didn't accept me right away because you know i was a new york kid out in california but to your point i had that research if you will that turned me into that guy versus i was the expert trying to flip it um so anyway um so there there's a there's a process i mean i you don't work with somebody and say okay let me see your presentation great here we'll fix it goodbye Right. So there's a there's a process that you guys go through. And, and I love this this t term you gave it, which is story to stage. Um, 
that I love that 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 is so descriptive and it's about a nine step process. So let's let's talk about this. So how do you typically engage with somebody and and how do you work them through this process and and also the time. I mean this doesn't this doesn't look like something that happens in a, in 2 weeks, right? This just takes a little bit of time. So t- let's let's delve into your story to stage. So I'll take you for, from the point of which we decided to start it and why that was, because it's so much more than writing a talk. If you can have the world's best talk, which is like a, a beautiful fall leaf lying on the forest floor, it doesn't matter how pretty it is. If nobody knows it exists, you know, it's not going to be it's not going to be heard. And where most speakers, they get a couple of problems wrong. One, they think their job is over when the mic drops. So when the, the audience applauds, that's not the end of your job. That's that you finished the marketing component of your project, and now you've got to convert their audience into your audience. And I was frustrated that most speakers weren't understanding this. That they thought that you know I'm going to go out there, I'm going to get paid a fee, and then I'm going to do my talk, and then I'm going to be a paid speaker. And I don't think being the speaker is. And I look not to take away. I've been a, a professional paid speaker for the last 17 years, and I understand that you can make really good money. But last year I got six figures from uh, for speaking, but I got seven figures from it. Because when you get off that stage, if you've done your job well enough, and that doesn't mean being overly salesy, you can absolutely convert their audience into your audience. So that was a departure point. The other thing is that most speakers don't understand what their area of authority is. And they limit themselves to become a stone through a speaker, a speaker whose influence is as far as they can throw a stone because they'll hit somebody else talking about the same thing. So you're a sports person who went through adversity and you want to talk about that. You want to talk about the one trophy you won or perseverance or or you're a marketer or you want to talk about using AdWords, whatever you can hit. You know, that's not going to be your corner of the universe is going to have any influence. So I wanted to create a process to help people, first of all, understand what is a small corner of the world that you can own. To me, a brand is simply a, an area of real estate in somebody else's brain. And somewhere there's a, there's a blank plot of land available for your flag. And most speakers are happy to plot themselves into an overpopulated territory and just add themselves to the mix. I believe that you should try and be out there and find a frontier in which you can own your space. Once you have that, well, then we have to work out what that looks like and what that talk is. And we actually get our speakers to create the sales material for their talk before they've made a single slide. Then you go out and you sell it. And if nobody buys it, you tweak it and you sell it. And then when somebody buys it, which will help you through, then and only then do we start worrying about how to make a talk. Because, and there's a great jazz musician, Duke Ellington. He says, I don't need time. What I need is a deadline. You can spend with Parkinson's law, you'll spend, if you've got six months to make a keynote, that's how long it will take you to make. But if somebody's paid you to show up on a stage next week, Thursday, well, then that's how long it takes. And so that's the job is we want to get you a booking and then we actually build the content because you're crapping yourself enough to know that you have to do this. Once we get you onto the stage, obviously, we want to help you with your technology and, and how to use it and your stagecraft because it turns out stagecraft matters. And especially now in presenting online. And then finally, we want to make sure that you amplify and build your audience afterwards. So we have nine steps to take you through getting to try and build an engine. A lot of the, your guests can't see, but there's a lot of board games behind me, which is my passion. And my favorite genre of games are engine builders. Games that, that where you're actually building a better machine. And then eventually it ticks over and you've got this, this, this profit generating thing. And that's what I think a public speaker should be doing as well. They should be building an engine. So I think the only thing that Riz didn't really touch on there was how long the, the program is and what it looks like. Um, so basically, the process is you apply um, for, for an interview and a, d- a discovery phase pre the actual program. So it's really important for us to ensure that, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's our reputation on the line. And we want to make sure that everybody goes through this program and becomes like a success. So we've got to make sure that, that there's a fit. So there's quite a robust um, discovery and interview process that happens beforehand. Um, and then once you accept it to the program, there's a, a week or so of onboarding just to kind of get your frame of reference into the right space and make sure that the right lenses are on. And then it's at the moment we're still in pilot phase. So it's running ideally in a three month program. So 12, 12 weeks with three calls a week. 
So the calls are not mandatory at all, and it's not where actually the the, the program sits. That is where the community sits and the the um, the sharing and a, a lot of the advantages and learnings, but that's where the questions are asked. So as you go through the syllabus, if you've got certain questions that come up, you you open them up to a platform where Rich and the team will address those questions, but also pose them to people within the cohort or, or on the program with us, which is really powerful because you've got people looking at it from different industries, different walks of life, different perspectives, which is really cool. Um, but for the most part, the program happens um, asynchronously. So you have access to a bunch of um, collateral and uh, videos. And then we work in workbooks in Notion that give you um, basically a full playbook at the end of the program. Richard, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that what, when we worked through this, it was a big frustration for me is that a lot of even what we had done in the past, where I felt that we developed talks for speakers, speakers came to us, they paid us, we worked through them, our team went and developed the content and made made material for them, coached them and, and sent them on their way. It Having the deck wasn't effective enough. And I see a lot of these programs, it was something we originally considered doing, where, you know, we work together for a week and at the end of this one week intensive, you're going to get a, a talk, and you're going to be able to do it. I simply don't think that works. I don't think this is a week long process. It's there's so much discovery internally for you to do to figure out what corner of the world you want to own. We, we're forcing people into three months and they're getting uncomfortable with the clip that we're, we're asking them to move at. And that's three months. And I, I feel like a lot of people, I could get a talk out of you in 24 hours and we could have you ready to deliver it tomorrow. But it's not going to be your trademark talk. It's just going to be a good enough. Mm -hmm. And and that's my frustration with a lot of what I what I saw out there and what I, I what the trap it looked like we were falling into as a business was that we were giving people a tool, but we weren't it wasn't the right tool and we weren't teaching them how to use it properly. And and so I would be wary of any of these one week walk out of there with a keynote and you know you're going to be the world's next speaker. I, I've I've never I've yet to see any of those people on any major stage. Nobody gets abs in six weeks. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and if you figure that out, let me know. Um, the uh, So you said a couple things that are really interesting. Um, so it sounds like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you've pivoted a bit that, that just because someone wants to use your services doesn't mean they'll get to use your services. That you're being more, I won't say the word selective, but you're putting them through a screening process probably I would imagine I do that when I talk to a prospective client. I don't t take everybody. Hey, I'd love to get their 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 income, but a lot of times they're just not the right fit, the, the way they think. I mean, I've had people call me and say, I don't believe in marketing. Convince me. Pass. Not interested. Right. You, we're, and then I get why I said, because we're going to have this conversation every day. No matter what I do, you're not going to think it's moving the needle or whatever it is. So I'm not I don't want to work with you. It's just not a good fit. So I would imagine you get some of that, right? Hey, so I want Tom comes along, Mary comes along. I want to be a speaker, make me a deck and they kind of go through the motions, but maybe they're not the right fit for your program. They may. In, so first of all, yes, and we've turned away, I would say probably a third of the speakers who've approached us um, because I actually just say to them, like, you're going to give us your money and I'm not sure this is the time and this is the right program for you. There are some presenters, where, there are some people who have not been right for the program, but we're happy to make them something in our business. You know, the, the, the more legacy business can say, like, we can help you create a sales deck for your, that's no problem. We do that all day long. But I, my, my friend Howard Mann, I don't know if you've ever had him on the show, but he, he says you, you define your business by what you say no to. And I've always held that to be true. Like Missing Link, when we started, even though I'm an entrepreneur myself, we had a zero entrepreneur policy. We would not deal and uh, this was up until recently, maybe four years ago, I would not accept money from somebody who was paying it with their own checkbook because they're nightmare crappy clients. They they want to, they're actually spending money, whereas everybody else we dealt with is spending budget. And I would rather deal with somebody spending budget over somebody spending money, you know, all day long. This was one of the first times that not only are we dealing with, we're actually dealing with the person who pays us the money is the person going through the program. They're on the hook. And so we actually want people who care. The one person so far that's kind of didn't work out in the program, and it's been a real big hit. We've had one person who wrote us a letter to apologize. And this dude was basically too wealthy 
And the investment he made in us, well, it seemed like a cool idea, but it was never going to give the time to make it work. And he was like, nah, you know, it didn't matter. Whereas everybody else, we want to feel that this matters. You're making a go for this. And we explained to them, so part of our metrics as a business is dependent, and we don't take commissions off our speakers, but part of our success metrics as a business is depending on the dependent on the billings of people who go through our program. So our success criteria and the bonuses that we pay out and get to our team is dependent on how well other unrelated human beings do. And we have no control over them. We can try help push them, but we, we can't do it. So that means that we've got to make sure that the people we let in are going to be likely uh, to succeed in the program. Because my bonus is dependent on you doing you doing the work. The, let's let's talk a little bit about going from giving presentations. I do a lot of presentations, but they're typically marketing for me, right? I'm trying to uh, show that I have an expertise, and to your point, the people in the audience. Hopefully, there's one or two people that will say, "I've I've got to talk to this guy. I've got to engage with him." And then there's that coveted payment. You know, I've been paid, I can't say big fees, but I've been paid to do some of these of all. And then there, of course, there's the guy I was talking about earlier that does nothing but public speaking and he's making uh, seven figures. And that's all he does all year round is make presentations. So how do you, how does someone decide or you help someone decide when they're worth being paid for? And the other part of that question is, do you help people and I couldn't I couldn't I don't think you do but do you help identify and create opportunities for your clients as a speaker I mean for the last few years I hadn't been involved in missing link I have a full-time leadership team and I had been a speaker last year I was in South Africa at home with my family seven days in a row only twice in the year being a full-time speaker is actually not that great a job in fact it's quite intellectually unfulfilling uh, because you're traveling around, you're saying content, you, you've got a, search, a certain amount of keynotes, you have them pretty dialed in, and it's not thinking work. I actually missed running the business. I believe the, the holy grail of speakers is the one in between. So, in fact, there's a, there's a hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is where I've created a talk that's on a system, and there are people all over the world that are credited in my thinking, and they want to talk about that. So Vern Harnish has a system and you hire the Gazelle's system and you want to become an expert speaking at that. You get paid to speak at that and, and Vern Harnish will get paid because you did. That is amazing. On the flip side for me is I want to, as I said, turn up and be paid to speak and I charge a, a, a fair amount and they've got to fly me halfway around the world. Cape Town is not close. And I will come out there and I'll speak. And then as a result of that, I have something to offer to engage with the audience afterwards other than just another speaking gig. And I think that's where we have to get to. Now, the closest avatar to that is you, what you just described. If you are standing out there and you're thought leader, doing thought leadership through your business and you're giving something that is compelling enough for an organization to want to hire your business because of something you said in 45 minutes, you've made them smart enough that they want to hire your business to, uh, you know, at a project way bigger than your speaking fee, well, then why wouldn't you charge for that? The only reason you're not charging for your talks is because you've just not decided to. There's literally no more science than that. It's not that you shouldn't. It's just that you are not charging. So the next time somebody contacts you and says, hey, um, Angela, I'd like you to speak at this marketing summit, there's two things you have to do. First of all, when they try to give you a topic to speak about, you say, no, this is what I talk about. And the second thing is when they say to you, would you be willing to do it? So sure, no problem at all. My fee is $5,000. I'll happily come out there. And then, you know, somebody says yes, and then you're a paid speaker. And then you realize, wow, it was that easy. Most people just say yes because somebody else asked them to say yes. And because the client didn't offer a fee, they just are too embarrassed to ask for one. Everybody who asked me to speak at their conference, I say, thanks so much. I really, really appreciate that. Here's my fee. And uh, then they either pay it or they don't. It depends, though. I will speak at events for free, definitely, if they're the right audience. Because in my mind, there's three ways for you to make 100K speaking. One is to do you know, 25K jobs. And then you better make sure that you have a, you know, like really good marketing engine and things like this that you've got to sell yourself. The other is to do five 20K jobs. And then, you know, you probably need a New York Times bestseller or a TED talk. And the third way is to speak at the right audience for free and then, you, you know, make it off business from there. So you've got to decide where you fit on one of those three things. But we all should be paid when we get off stage. So in terms of, um 
are you, are you referring to do we help you book stages? Is that is that basically yes. what you're asking? Yeah. So Angelo, we, we don't book stages for our speakers. What we do have is we we share our network and our and our um, opportunities. So we obviously we I say obviously Missing Link has worked with every I would say pretty much every big corporate um, company and enterprise in South Africa. We have a lot of access to the corporate market in terms of that kind of avatar for speakers. We also have a great relationship with all the TEDx stages regionally and um, Rich and I have both, Richard has spoken and we both worked with TED Global before. So we have nice um, opportunities um, to be able to link them. What's amazing about Story to Stage though is that we we show them that they need to build that authority and then help them with access to certain stages about how do you actually pitch yourself in a certain way that's going to stand out and be remarkable that you will, if, if somebody is curating for an event and she's got five speakers in front of her that she chooses you every time. I, I like that approach because it really in, puts the speaker uh, involved, right? You're talking about the, the wealthy guy before he wrote a check and, and didn't really want to put kind of the time into it, right? As a guy, you know, no big deal. I, I'm not, I don't care about the money. So I think that's part of it about being engaged as as the as the speaker. Well, I think that that, that is a core cool thing about our program, and I think why people are having such a an incredible experience on it is because we actually make you or ensure that you are going to be best version of self, that you are your most authentic version. So that when you stand up on that stage, like you're going to have the impact and be that provoking speaker and activate the audience in the way that you want to. Um, and in doing that, building that business on the other side, so not just standing up and uh, having the incredible talk, but making sure that you are collecting that audience and engaging with them and seeing how you can chat to them along the line. Like Rich says, you how do you make – the audience that you stand in front of become not the 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 the, the person who bought, who paid for you's audience, but your own. So mm -hmm. you, every time you get up on stage, there should be more work for you. And you to want do. to do that without being yeah. salesy. And just the one thing I wanted to mention, Angelo, just before we move on from this, I think it's important that people understand the myth of the speaking agent. It gives you the, the speaking agent is a, such a terrible false sense of security. You come home and you've been put on a speaking agent's uh, books. And I'm on tons of speaking agents' books, but they're not. their business is not to find you a gig. Their business is to fill a slot with the easiest person they can fill. So if they have you and 101 celebrity who charges the same as you, they'll always put that person forward because they're an easier sale. And they're competing against the other speaking agents for that slot. So I, I worry that a lot of speakers think that if I'm on an AR, oh, but I have a speaking agent, they're going to do all the work for me. I have never yet met the speaker. Unless, unless they're one of the top celebrities, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's agent or something like that, where they believe like, hey, I've got a speaking agent and they just brought me all this work. A friend of mine who's a global three-time TED speaker uh, said that he'd been getting so much work from a speaking agent. And one day he employed a, an assistant and he said, well, why don't I get the, just the traffic that comes from my office to go to my assistant and then I'll just take the other work from the speaking agent. And to, uh, uh, in this case, a penny, because it was a pounds and pennies, uh, he didn't, he realized that he was giving 100% of the traffic to his speaking agent and they were just cycling it back to him. He ended up doing the exact same amount by just keeping those leads internally and he was getting no extra value from the speaking agency. So, so I just think it's worthwhile knowing the reality, which is you are in control. You are your own marketer. If you are a speaker, it doesn't matter how many agents you have, you're in control anyway. So never trust someone who says that they'll, they, they can change that. Okay. I, I want to go back just a couple things that you said in your process. And, and I love that, that you create the collateral in the marketing materials, if you will, first before anything else. Normally it's create the pre. I mean, in my mind, I create the presentation and I've tried to figure out how to go market it. Right. In this case, it's like, well, let me create the materials first, market it, and if I get the gig, we'll do it. Because you made a you made a point. If, if you give me a 30 days to, before I have to speak, I'll take me 30 days to create the presentation. The one I just gave like two weeks ago, I ended up doing literally two days before the event, and I had three weeks to do it. So uh, absolutely. The other thing that I, I find in, in your process 
is is about the audience and how to build the audience and, and utilize the audience was there for future business, future work, whatever it happens to be. Because so many times, you know, after I give, you know, when there were live presentations, people come up, they congratulate, you do all these things and you grab a bunch of business cards, but, you know, they're not necessarily the re a relationship and trying to build those and depending on if you can get a hold of the list and stuff. So I, I, I find that, you know, for me, it's like a ta-da, of course, I understand that, but, you know, it just reinforced that is something that we constantly need to do um, when we do that. But but I did want to ask, is you're working with people, certainly in, in getting them prepped, let's say, for on stage, but now on Zoom, right? So how has that kind of changed your process and how have you had to pivot to, you know, I mean, again, for someone to, because ultimately if they're doing a Zoom meeting, a lot of times, depending on the nature of it, if they're using slides, for example, they're usually just a little square box on the screen versus if they're doing some kind of, uh, you know, full screen and just talking and not having any strong visuals. I mean, it's definitely a different game now. So how do you guys address that? So the first thing is you can decide to not make that the case. I'm doing a, a, a presentation this week for Prezi, and Prezi has a tool called Prezi Video. And Prezi Video allows you to create very, very easy picture-in-picture -picture slides. So you can control, you can have a slide up next to you like a newsreader, it can be full screen. And what I particularly like about Prezi's approach is that it doesn't require a green screen. It's not trying to do anything behind you. It's operating in the space in front of you. So it actually says, well, hey, I'm not going to have to key out anything. So I'm in complete control of how I share my slides. If you can see my camera, then you can see my slides. I don't have to share anything separately, and there's ways to work around that. Of course, there are ways of sharing in Zoom, where in, in Teams, you'll always be either a big screen or full screen you or a small you. We actually teach people how within Zoom, you're, there's actually a lot you can play with to make sure that you're 50% of the image and your audience is, and your slide is 50% of the image. And in fact, so to me, this is your biggest opportunity. The fact that presentations are happening on Zoom, it has never been easier for you to get speaking gigs because now nobody's taking the risk flying you halfway around the world. Now you can be that person say, hey, this is what I wanna do. This is, this is my idea. And they're like, yeah, sure, let's do it next week, Thursday because they can. So it, it is an upgrade. The other thing that I think people are doing wrong is they're trying to get too fancy. So there, I don't know if you've been to any of these webinars and things where they've, they've got these full 3D virtual studios and you've got this person who's standing way far back in there, you know, all the way over there. And like, that's not, that's not, a, the stage was never a feature. The stage was always fixing a bug. The reason that I'm high up is so that the people in the back rows can see me. And now what's happened is everybody has a front row seat. So we teach people how to engage, where to look how to utilize this. And it turns out if you can just use one or two small little tools better than the other person, because the barrier to entry is so low, the quality is also so low. So in the land of, of two and three out of tens, if you're a four, you're winning. And of, of course, we want our speakers to be higher than that. But a couple of small little tips will get you so far ahead of everybody else, just standing when you're speaking. Most presenters now are presenting mm -hmm. from their bums. I don't understand what happened. I saw this stand-up comedian, and he, he made this joke at the beginning of his set. He said, you know, for the last 25 years, I've been a stand-up comedian. For the last six months, I've been a sit-down comedian. Why? Why are you sitting down, bro? Stand up. Show your audience that you're engaging with them. So there is certainly a couple of small little hacks and tips. In fact, that's one of the easiest things. I think for a lot of us, for, for myself, I definitely prefer uh, presenting this way. In fact, I want to start now controlling. I was a lighting designer in my past career. I want to start making it that when I change slides, my whole lighting state changes. Now I'm now I'm my own crew. So now I can be stage crew as well as the speaker. Like I've never been more excited. It's a great time to get into this or to be excited about it. Okay. Yeah, it was a great. I was going to comment uh, standing up versus sitting down. Obviously, it's. I think all the presentations I've given is sitting down. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Italian. So, you know, my hands are waving and I, I need to move. And I find a lot of times getting that energy sitting is it, it, I have to really dig deep to make that being really enthusiastic when I'm presenting because, you know, I'm just sitting. It, it's not not quite the same. A lot of great content here. You've shared a lot of wonderful things. So I have one last question for both of you. And I'm going to go with you first, Sam. Sure. What inspires you 
every day? What when you get out of bed, what inspires you? Like in this year? <laughs> well, yeah. sure. In, in the, in the, in this you tell year, me. In this year, I guess what inspires me is that every day seems to look different. Time is almost stood still and and how quickly things change and evolve in such a short period of time has also made me realize that like time is really like a a, a, a form of like something we need to be more pressure and it needs to take be more cognitive of should i say all right cool rich same for you the, what, what inspires me and what, what maybe excites me right now is the fact that I think that we're going to look back at this. People talk about this year as a crisis and pandemic, and, and I see people on Facebook wishing it was over. I think the future, future you is going to look back at this and hold current you accountable to how you behaved. Because future you, you is going to look back at this and realize this was the greatest accelerator uh, in your career. This was the most accelerated area of growth in your entire career. And if you look back, if I have future me looks back at current me and says that all you did was make TikTok videos and fill out quizzes on Facebook of what kind of rock star are you, uh, you'll be deeply disappointed. I want to make sure that if the world is accelerating, that we as a business and us as thinkers are accelerating with it. I don't want it to get away from me. And, and that, I think, is a, a tricky space because it's moving so fast that I want to be at the front of the charge pulling it uh, rather than getting left behind. And the fact that, you know, despite going to uh, revenue zero in March, the fact that last month was our best month in our company's 23-year history means that as of now, we're managing to keep the pace. And I'm, I'm very excited. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. So um, one of you, I uh, want you to tell the audience uh, – how they can reach you and connect with you and your website and all that good information. So if you go to INeedMissingLink.com, you'll see they'll direct you to our site and you'll be able to see all the offerings we have. And if you want to get in touch with me personally, if you go to GetRich.af, uh, you'll be able to connect with me on LinkedIn where I'm quite, uh, that seems to be my platform of choice, but it's linked to all my social profiles there. Well, believe it or not, folks, we, we made it through uh, quite a bit of the content today, but right at the very end, we lost connection. So uh, I'm glad we made it through. And, and certainly uh, thank you to Rich and Samantha. And, and you found out how to reach Rich and also Missing Link. And if you want to connect with Samantha, Samantha Dean Leonsinus, and you can find her on LinkedIn and you can reach out right there or certainly through their website. I want to thank you again for sticking with me here at the cafe today. This has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking about presentations. It's, it's something I'm very passionate about and, and I strive to do as many as possible, as I mentioned. And so, again, if you're looking for a presenter and I have a wide variety of topics, please don't hesitate to reach out and let's have a conversation. And if your business needs a CMO or senior level marketing leadership, but you're not quite ready for a full time person yet, or you need some C senior level guidance, Connect with me to find out more about my fractional interim and consulting services. You can visit theponzigroup.com to find a variety of resources there, blogs, videos, ebooks, and certainly connect with me on LinkedIn. And lastly, if you're a subscriber to the show, I want to thank you for being so. And I'd like you to tell others that you know that could benefit from this show as well and encourage them to listen. So they can benefit from the great content like we heard today. You can visit the businessgrowthcafe.com or certainly find us on any podcast platform you like to listen to. So please don't forget to join me next week here at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.